What's going on guys, it's Braun Lee Empire Barbell and today we're gonna to talk about how to increase your deadlift without actually deadlifting. Now real quick, I'm trying to put out as much content as possible. For right now, I'm committed to putting out four videos a week. You guys don't wanna to have to play catch up with the videos, so to make sure you don't miss anything, go ahead and click the subscribe button and the notification bell. The more of you guys I have watching, the more content I can justify putting out on a weekly basis. So thank you for your support guys, you've all been awesome. So to start out, this was a question that was put in the comments on uh, one of the videos last week, and it struck a chord with me because this is something I've had to consider in the past when I was trying to get my training organized. As time goes on, you'll uh, come across obstacles. You have to pivot your training based on uh, whatever real world circumstances you're dealing with. And sometimes that means putting a lift on the back burner. So the reasons that you might want to deprioritize actual barbell deadlifting are listed here. Uh, might be because you're prioritizing other things. Uh, if you're prioritizing, let's say your squat, if you're going through something like Smolov, you would be a fool to try to run Smolov uh, while deadlifting. That just would not work out. Uh, super squats is another one. Uh, it's a very hard squat program. For that reason, they don't recommend regular conventional deads. They recommend some Romanian or stiff leg variation. Um, Strongman events, if I don't have a deadlift coming up in a meet and I need to put more effort into other events, then I will happily take deadlifts off the table because of the recovery costs they have. Uh, sports is another one. Uh, it's good to take athletes, football players, rugby players, and uh, get them as strong as possible, and that might include deadlifts in the off season. The recovery cost makes it a poor choice for including uh, in the regular season when you're focused on maintaining those qualities and keeping you in shape for the games. So. Prioritizing other things is a big reason you would want to take deadlifts off the table in certain circumstances. Uh, another common reason is working around injury. This is something I've also had experience with. If you lift long enough, you'll get lower back issues. You'll get, uh, I've had bicep and shoulder issues that made it so pulling really just wasn't an option and I had to get creative. And then the last uh, scenario is uh, some type of training limitation. Uh, some of you guys might lift in uh, a garage in your apartment complex where your neighbors don't appreciate the clang of weights every time you drop the bar. Many of you guys train at something like a Planet Fitness where an alarm is gonna go off and everybody's gonna look at you if you actually dare to do conventional deadlifts. So all of these are good reasons that you might not want to deadlift and it's important to know how to work around that to get the best possible result. If you're prioritizing the things you wanna be able to maintain, you wanna make sure that you don't backslide. If you're working around injuries, similarly, you wanna be able to do as much productive work as you can so when you are healthy, you can hit the ground running again. And uh, even if training limitations are really what's keeping you back, that means you wanna get as much as possible out of whatever you can, even if it isn't a deadlift. So to talk about other alternatives to actual deadlifting, let's break down how the human body moves. There's two basic movement patterns the lower body goes through, and pretty much all athletic endeavors are gonna be some, some mix of these two. And it's essentially just a squat or a deadlift type movement. A squat is a knee bend. You're essentially upright, the hip sinks low, the knee moves forward, and you get a lot of movement in that knee joint. So we call it knee dominant movement, some type of squat movement. A deadlift type movement is gonna be a hip hinge. That's gonna be where most of the movement is in the hip. Just think of bending over. Now, ideally with a hinge, uh, you're talking about keeping the spine neutral. We generally don't like to have a lot of movement in the spine. So you're keeping the spine rigid and we're putting all the movement in the hip joint. So that means knees staying back a little bit more, everything shifting back, and that loads the posterior. So squatting type movements, uh, they both use the musculature of the lower body, and that's important. So when you're, let's say, putting together a powerlifting program, you have to take into account the shared stress and reconcile that with how they develop differently because they overlap, but not so much that just doing one is gonna make you better at the other. So squatting is very knee dominant, which means the quad gets hit. Uh, the quad also gets hit in a hinge or in a deadlift type movement, but just not as much, and that's just strength training 101. The quad doesn't go through as much range of motion. It doesn't load eccentrically quite the same way. Uh, it doesn't have to control in reverse direction. The bar gets deloaded on the ground. So those are all uh, really the things that, that tend to increase development. So even though the quad gets used, it's not really a target of a deadlift type movement. The posterior, on the other hand, is where the glutes do get used in the squat, uh, the glutes get used heavily in a, in a hinge, but also along with the uh, hamstrings and the upper back. So it's common in people who are squat specialists to see hamstring deficiencies. Uh, it's also possible to build up a pretty big squat without your upper back or midsection being quite as rigid as it might need to be to put up a really big deadlift. And we see that in this uh, bent over hinge position. So the key to keeping your deadlift moving, or at the very least maintaining those qualities, is going to be keeping those muscles strong 
by doing targeted exercise to help bring those up, but also by working the hinge type pattern. So a lot of these muscles that are used concurrently in both, even if they develop, the glutes are a good example, the glutes develop in a squat, but even if they develop the way they're coordinated, the way they pattern might be a little bit different, which means the carryover isn't going to be 100%. So we also need to practice patterning. Uh, you can't really effectively bring your deadlift up unless you're actively doing some type of hinge pattern that somehow mirrors what your deadlift position is like. So to start out, uh, the stabilizing muscles and the exercises that build those, Remember, everything above the waist stabilizes your spine. That's your midsection, your abs, your erectors, your upper back. Everything below are the main movers. The glutes and hamstrings, that's what actually moves you. That's what levers you up. So we can look at the deadlift uh, into kind of two parts as we try to figure out uh, how to prioritize which exercises. So the upper back, and I include the upper back by itself because the abdominals, midsection, the erectors, they get hit on a lot of these secondary exercise so it's they don't you don't really need erector isolation work as long as you're doing some type of hinge movement the upper back however can lag and spending special attention on that especially when you're not doing deadlifts that's going to be a, a big asset to you my favorite one is bent rows that's a king of upper back exercises i like to stay in this position pitched over floating the bar about two inches above the ground you can absolutely do penlay rows but i like to float the bar because it reinforces positioning it reinforces uh, stabilizing, keeping a rigid midsection under a load. So it really helps dial in this pattern more so than I think something like a Penlay row or a Yates row would. So I like to say strict, really focus on keeping that back tight, keeping that midsection rigid, and then pulling under control somewhere in between your belly button and the bottom of your diaphragm. It's a fantastic upper back builder. If your bent row goes up substantially over a period of time, you can be sure that when you go back to deadlifts, at the very least, your positioning is gonna be better. Your stabilization is gonna be better. Uh, another notch down is gonna be things like chest supported rows, seal rows, uh, and then pull downs, uh, pull ups, vertical pulling movements. Uh, they're, they're very relevant, but uh, they're not quite as specialized towards a deadlift, but they're easy to throw in, easy to recover from, and you'll benefit from them all the same. Uh, and then going down into power shrugs. Power shrugs are a good one and they're often overlooked. If you're not deadlifting from the floor, uh, setting a pin in the rack uh, a little bit above your knee and then doing kind of an explosive rack pull into a shrug. It's a great way to keep your hip extension alive. It's a great way to keep your upper back strong. It's a good way to practice supporting weight. Again, it doesn't matter how strong your hamstrings get if the musculature that supports your upper body is not used to the weight that's going to be a weak link when you do go back to deadlifting uh, and they're easier to recover from you know they're easy to throw in uh, without really tearing you down or, or interfering with any of these issues um, gluten ham work so now we're getting down into uh, the actual movers okay these are the things that move your hips these are the things that get that bar moving off the ground and get it going into a very strong explosive lockout so squatting movements are going to dominate because squatting again uses a lot of the same musculature so assuming you're not doing some crazy squat workout like Smolov or super squats or something, uh, then you have some leeway in putting in variations that are gonna be a little bit more deadlift specific. Pause squats are fantastic. Box squats are fantastic. On both of those, you're demonstrating control. You're coming to a stop with box squats. You break the stretch shortening cycle and it's the muscles of the hip that have to fire to get you moving up off that box and that carries over immensely to deadlifting. I found specifically to, to power and speed off the floor, which is a really good thing to emphasize on. There was a run I had where I had a lower back injury and I could squat, but I couldn't deadlift. And I did about three months of box squats and I came back by the time my back was healthy, my hips were so tight and I had so much power off the ground. So I'm a big fan of box squats. I like to go a little wider, sit on the box, about parallel, an inch high maybe, don't go too high because then you're just gonna be stroking your ego. Um, Make sure you come to a dead stop, don't rock, and then use your hamstrings and your glutes, feel them fire to kick you off the box. And it's gonna feel slow at first, but as it gets quicker, that's where you know that power is coming from. Pretty much all squats are gonna have this effect. They're all gonna hit the glutes uh, in some way, the quads in some way, in a way that's gonna help with your pulling power. Uh, front squats, huge on the upper back. Your posterior has to stay loaded to keep you upright, to keep you from tipping forward. So front squats are great. First time I did zercher squats, I remember my ass was sore for a week. So uh, a lot of squatting variations. 
Uh, I prefer pause and box variations, but you can definitely throw in other ones to try and keep you well-rounded. Uh, then we go into direct glute and ham work, isolation work, talk about back extensions, glute ham raises. I'll do back extensions 45 degree or on a glute ham deck, they're both great. And that's where you start to get a lot of erector work in too. Uh, when I do those, I try to emphasize the hinge pattern, really bracing and focus on pushing my hips back and pushing them forward into the pad to make it a little more hinge specific hamstring curls you you guys are not above getting on a hamstring curl machine this is one of the best probably underused machines for developing your deadlift because the hamstrings can be very hard to hit by themselves uh, even with a solid hinge pattern it's really easy for say the glutes to take over uh, the way i'm built my quads and glutes get away with a lot and my hamstrings don't have to take on a big uh, a big load so i have to get creative so i target those and hamstring curls have been fantastic. You can do them single leg, double leg. We've attached a band to it so it gets heavier the, the closer your, your feet get your butt. Uh, we'll do sets of five and six. We'll do sets of 15 and 20. We'll do running drop sets. We'll super set them. Hamstring curls are fantastic. Uh, and then glute bridges to target the glutes. And again, really emphasize driving the hips forward, getting that extension down. So this is just a good mix of kind of generalized building for the main movers and the stabilizers. Going in to the last category, this is where you really have to dial in the coordination. Because again, it doesn't matter how strong you get or how, uh, how much you develop the musculature of those movements. If you are not practicing a hinge, you're gonna be missing out. So this is where the scenario is going to play in because you'll pick movements differently if you're trying to get as strong as possible and you just don't have the option of dropping a barbell versus if you actually have an injury and that's what's, what's keeping you back. So probably the easiest hinge pattern to follow is a, a deadlift variation like a Romanian or a stiff leg deadlift. Uh, they're more controlled. You can put a tempo on them. You can adjust your positioning to make it easier or harder depending on what your goal is. They're great for hypertrophy. They're great for uh, developing control in the deadlift. They're great for building a mind-muscle connection. You know, really slow uh, RDLs is, is how I get a lot of hamstring engagement that I normally don't get. So these are fantastic movements. Now, that being said, if you have a lower back strain, you're probably not gonna opt for something like that. So this is where you have to be careful. Maybe a kettlebell swing is gonna be a better option uh, where you're able to pattern that, uh, that hip extension, that hinge movement, but because the weight's lighter and the range of motion shorter, uh, it's good for getting blood in your lower back, but it's also not gonna be a really detrimental movement that's gonna make it worse. So uh, that's where you have to be careful. Uh, shoulder and bicep injuries I've had, I'll go straight to a good morning. If I can't hold the weight, good mornings are fantastic. Again, it's the same movement. Try to imagine where your back is, what your hip angle is at the start of your deadlift normally. That's kind of where you wanna shoot for. You wanna make sure you don't squat into it, keep it in your hips, load back into your glutes and hamstrings. Uh, make sure you stay braced. I like to do it with a tempo. I like to pause at the bottom. I, instead of just trying to get as heavy as possible with good mornings, I really like to use it as a way of demonstrating building control. And that's where I get a lot out of them. Uh, sometimes I'll do them to pins and I can go a little heavier. Sometimes I'll do it a little steeper, sometimes a little higher. You have a lot of variation. You have a lot of options with that. I recommend picking one or two variations and, and, and really focusing on getting good instead of just changing it every time. Uh, safety bars are good for putting it in your upper back. Cambered bars are good because you can pull them back. That puts it more in your hips. Straight bars are good because that's probably all you have access to. Um, trap bar, that is another one. Now with a trap bar, you want to make sure that you keep it a hinge movement. You don't turn it into a, a squat from the bottom. Um, a lot of guys are built to trap bar deadlift. I am very good at it. Uh, Eric King, who trains our gym, he's very good at it. But the way we're good at it is our shorter legs make it easy to push our butt forward. So we kind of scoop forward and then it just turns into a squat and that's not quite what you want to do. So when you do a trap bar dead, think about setting up with your butt a little higher. Think about getting pitch forward. Make sure it's a hinge, right? We're doing it, yeah, to get a little weight, yeah, to, uh, to practice some overload, but primarily if you want it to carry over to your deadlift, it has to be a hinge. And uh, I like these uh, in, in pretty much all of these because even if you do have a low back injury, uh, keeping the weight back can take some strain off your lower back so you can still get a little bit of hinge work without really killing yourself. Uh, it's a fantastic way um, you know, you do something like an RDL. You don't have to worry so much about dropping the weight. You can do really controlled trap bar deadlifts. You can really drive strength up and go heavier uh, if you're not limited in training, but you're just trying to get a little extra recovery. You can really throw trap bars in and work them a little bit harder 
and it's still more recovery than the bar being displaced out in front of you like it is with a straight bar. Trap bar deads are fantastic. Um, the fourth category and the last one, it's not mandatory. It depends on how you like to train, what, what equipment you have access to. It's certainly not going to be applicable to all of these, but a uh, strongman training is huge when it comes to building your deadlift. Now, they're not all created equal. If you've been competing in strongman for a period of time, you've probably noticed kind of a net growth in how strong your back is, how good your hip extension is. But, you know, doing yoke runs, is it going to build your deadlift up? Doing bag tosses, is it going to jack your deadlift up? Doing tire flips, is it going to jack your deadlift up? The two categories of movements that are the absolute best, the ones I drilled the hardest and that paid off the most, were loading movements and carry movements, specifically carries to the front. Ba uh, bag sandbags, atlas stones, and kegs, they're all about equal here. Um, front carries have a Husfell stone, but you could absolutely do like a keg carry or bag carry to the front. Uh, this is where your posterior chain is loaded the most. This is where you get the most uh, development in your upper back and your rectors. Uh, the act of having to get around something kind of rounds your back forward. And as you extend, the erectors and upper back have to work extra hard, specifically in a way they're not used to. And the, the improvements you see out of the gate are just huge. You get very strong very quick once you start taking these seriously. Don't turn it into a testing workout every time you go in where you're trying to pick up the heaviest damn bag you can find. Make sure that you get a certain amount of work in and progress evenly over time. Uh, let yourself get good at it. accrue an amount of volume, okay? Adapt to a certain amount of work instead of just trying to go heavier and heavier. Um, but when we do stone loading for reps over a bar, we'll set up a yoke, we'll load over it, have somebody roll it back, and we can get a good clip where we're we're practicing a lot of density. We're getting a lot of work in a short period of time. We're practicing that quick hip snap. You really start to feel your glutes just absolutely fry. And with this type of regular work, I mean, it's impossible for your deadlift not to respond to it. So again, you have to pay attention to what the scenario is. You know, you're not going to throw in a bunch of brutal bag carries if you're squatting four days a week. That's not really uh, optional. But if you have, let's say, let's say you're in season in a sport. You know, let's say your uh, your wrestling season just kicked off and you don't want to deadlift throughout the week because it's hard to recover from. You can do some light bag loads for quick reps. Keep your keep yourself explosive. You can do front carries to build some endurance. There's good GPP work as long as you're keeping the, the reps in the range appropriate. So this is a very productive way to build your deadlift up. And I know when I started Strongman, my deadlift exploded in a very short period of time because of all that training volume. Uh, as far as the amount of work you're going to be doing, again, it depends, but uh, most of the time, if you're not prioritizing deadlift, you're going to want to keep these away from maximal. So if you're not prioritizing a deadlift, it's injury recovery or training. You're probably not going to be warranted doing heavy triples, doubles, or singles. Your hinge pattern work, I'd recommend being five to eight reps for a lot of repeating sets. And you can work in a variety of RPEs. You know, you could ramp up and then ramp back down. You can do sets across, it, it, it's really up to you. Just as long as you're following some type of even steady progression and you're abiding by whatever the limitations are uh, based on whatever scenario applies to you. Uh, for this stuff, you can run the gambit as well. This is where we're gonna get into higher rep ranges for upper back work, gluten ham work. The squatting variation, similarly, five to eight reps is gonna be warranted. Uh, you can you know, get into some speed work with triples, um, especially with box squats to practice the kick off the box. But once you get good at that, I like to focus more on load than I do like to focus on speed. But you know, that's just me. Uh, for the isolation stuff, sets of eight to 10 are good, sets of 20 and up are good. I mean, there's no reason to, to hyper fixate on one, throw all of them in, you know, get good on the hamstring curl, get good at 20s for a few weeks, then move to eights, then move to 15s. You know, you don't have to be so, uh, dialed in with isolation work, you have a lot more leeway because we're not bound by the same rules of recovery that compound movements have with them. So this is my two cents on how to get your deadlift up without actually deadlifting. Maybe you've ran some programs that mirrored some of these principles. Uh, maybe you've put it into practice yourself. If you have any experience, go ahead and leave your uh, experience in the comment box or go ahead and take it to the forum, empire-forum.com. We have some good people operating in the forum, so uh, you can be sure you're gonna get a response to whatever questions you have. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, until next time, this is Bromley from Empire Barbell. I'll see you.